My name is Dr. Melissa Party. I'm very excited to have you here today. I'm the Curator of Geology here at the Research and Collection Center for the Illinois State Museum. I'm a paleontologist, and so I'm going to be showing you some fossils today in honor of National Fossil Day. We collect a bunch of fossils because they're the physical evidence we have of the things that lived in the past, whether they were plants or animals. This is the inside of the geology collection in our range. We have it organized with rocks and, rocks and minerals at the far end of the range. And then on the range side that I'm standing on now is where we keep all of our fossils. We keep them organized because we need to be able to find things. And when you have a lot of objects, it's really important to know where everything is. We have our fossil collections organized by, first, the type of organism it is, so whether it's a plant or an animal. The plants uh, are in this part of the range. So if you're interested in a fossil leaf that you might have, this is where I would come to, to look at, uh, to try and figure out what it is. We have lots of different types of fossils of animals in the collection, and we separate those out too. In this aisle is where we have a very large collection of all of our invertebrate fossils. And so those are things that don't have a backbone or bones inside of their body. And then we have our vertebrate collection. So these are fossils that come from animals that have skeletons. This part of the collection is organized by age, from oldest to my left, to youngest on my right. So here we have uh, fossils of fish and sharks, these are very old, hundreds of millions of years old, going up through the younger part of our collection. And this is where we have our Ice Age uh, fauna. So these are going to be animals like mammoths and mastodons, giant ground sloths, and saber-toothed cats. So the main focus of our collection is actually on fossils that mostly come from Illinois or from states that are near Illinois. Our focus is mostly the Midwest. And since it's National Fossil Day, I'm hoping that some of you have fossils at home and you're wondering what they are, or if you're going to be going outside, you might be places where there might be rocks with fossils. I might give you a little bit of a clue of what you might be looking at. So I pulled some fossils out of our collections uh, that have animals in them that I think you're, mo you're most likely to find if you're out fossil hunting in Illinois. So a lot of the rocks that you'll find in Illinois range in age between 300 and 350 million years old. And these are going to be rocks that are these kind of gray looking rocks, or this is a, a limestone, or you might have something that has a thin bedding that's more of a shale. A really common fossil that you find in Illinois is something called a crinoid. So this is a ancient relative of, of animals that were related to things like starfish, uh, sea cucumbers, and there actually are some of these still alive today, although the one that I'm showing you is extinct and there are only a few species left today. And so what this is, is it, they're also called sea lilies, although they're actually an animal. And in life, this animal would have had uh, a part that attached to the bottom of the ocean with a stalk and then uh, kind of a flower-shaped or uh, body part that had little arms at the top. The unfortunate thing is, is when these die, they tend to fall apart, and so you don't usually find large pieces of them stuck together. What you'll, what you'll find are these little tiny bits, and they kind of are, um, sometimes will look like little, little tires or Cheerios even. Um, but if you're really, really lucky, you may find a bunch of them still connected to each other, like um, I'm showing here. And then if you're incredibly lucky, you might still have a part of that head part that I was talking about with um, some of the parts still attached to that. Here's another example of a crinoid. This one is in really good condition. And you can see what I was talking about with uh, that top part of the animal still being intact and all together. So if you're very lucky, you might find something that looks like this. This next one's a little bit easier. This is a snail, and you can, these are distinctive, and you can see that they have this coiled shape to their shell. And, you know, if you see this, it'll definitely jump out at you as being a snail. 
They take a little bit different shapes, uh, potentially. So this one, instead of being more flattened, it's got more of a conical type shape. But they look a lot like the snails you'd see at the beach today. We have fossil corals in Illinois. They look a little bit different, though, from what we're used to seeing alive today. So what I'm holding here is what's called a horn coral. And you can see from its shape where it gets that name. This is actually one animal. So we typically think of corals as being a colonial organism where you have many individuals living together, forming a structure uh, and where they build a reef. But these are individuals. So the actual animal would, or the polyp would be living in this space right here. The next animal I'm gonna show you is one that you may not be familiar with. So this is actually a bryozoan. And these are animals that are currently still alive today, um, but they're not nearly as abundant as they used to be 300 million years ago. This particular fossil is one of my favorite kinds of bryozoans. It's called an Archimedes bryozoan. And when you look at a, a fossil bryozoan, what you'll see is that there's lots of little tiny holes on, on the, what you're looking at the structure here. But what each of those holes are, are actually each little individual animals. So like a coral, they're a colonial animal, but they're not closely related to coral at all. They form other structures as well, which are really beautiful. They can produce uh, stalk-like structures, or they can also produce these really delicate lace-looking like fronds. Um, and so in life, this animal uh, would have had a sca this scaffold that looks like a screw, and it would have the fronds coming off of it. And we have reconstructions of these at the museum. This next fossil is one that you're likely to find in Illinois for fossil hunting. It's a brachiopod. And it's got two shells. And you might be thinking, oh wow, that looks a lot like a clam. But they're very different from clams. They're not really closely related at all. The similarities between them pretty much lie just in that they have shells. You can tell it's a brachiopod because if you look at the front part of, part of the shell, it's symmetrical down through the middle. If you contrast that with a clam, they don't have that kind of symmetry just through one shell. So all of the fossils I just showed you are evidence that Illinois was very different 350 million years ago. They're all from underwater, which suggests that Illinois was under a sea at the time. We have other fossils here from 300 million years ago uh, that are also from an environment that's underwater, but a little bit closer to shore. And we know this because we get a combination of fossils from the water and on land. So we get uh, things like fishes and invertebrates, as well as plants. These fossils here actually come from a very famous locality here in Illinois. These are the Maison Creek fossils. And so this is a formation that has the ability to, to preserve uh, soft-bodied organisms. So we get really incredible preservation of things that don't have any hard parts, which is really rare in the fossil record. We get things like worms and uh, sea cucumbers. And then this specimen right here is especially interesting. This is actually a jellyfish that we have a fossil of. As I'd mentioned before, we don't just get uh, organisms that are from the water found at the Maison Creek. We also get plants. And this is what tells us that we're not too far from shore. This is a fossil called Lepidodendron. It's an ancient tree-like plant. And all of these little marks on the side here are scars from where there used to be these scale-like leaves coming off of the plant. The entire plant was photosynthetic, which was really different from what we think of trees today. And it's plants like these and a bunch of others that are actually what form the coal that we use today for electricity and power. Last but not least is the Tully Monster, our state fossil, which is also from the Maison Creek. It's a soft-bodied animal that has pinchers at the end of a long trunk-like appendage and also has stalks that come out of the side of the body. It's a really weird looking animal, but I love it. 
there's been a lot of debate on what this animal actually is, and people have argued about it, whether it's some kind of a mollusk, some kind of a worm, clam, and what we finally settled on is that it's a relative to vertebrates, so you and me. Here's a reconstruction of what this animal could have looked like in life. And here is a pincher at the end of a, a trunk and the eyes coming off the side of the body. And people love this animal so much, you can actually get it as a stuffed animal. Remember that fossils are the evidence we have that things have changed over time. They tell us that different plants and animals lived here and that environments have changed. The plants and animals that I was talking about previously were over 300 million years old. But Illinois has a fossil record that's much more recent as well. Over the last two million years, we've had episodes of glaciation and what are called interglacials that are warm periods of time. And we have fossils that document both of these types of time periods. I'm gonna show you a fossil now from 124,000 years ago during one of those warm periods. This piece of bone here is from a giant tortoise that was present in Illinois 124,000 years ago. So it's a pretty sizable piece of bone, but just so that people can get an idea of just how big this animal possibly was, I brought along some skeletons of modern tortoises that are present in Illinois. So this is a gopher tortoise. And so this is a bone that comes from the lower, the underside, the belly of the tortoise, in the back portion. It's this bone right here. And you can see the size comparison between these two bones. You can also see that it's a much thicker piece of bone than this modern tortoise. How do we know that it was warm at the time? Well, we can look at pollen. We also can tell from the, this fossil itself. This tortoise in the winter time goes into hibernation during the winter. But this animal would have been much too large to have a burrow to hibernate during the winter, which suggests that 124,000 years ago, Illinois winters remained above freezing, so it was warmer at the time. The Midwest was home to some icons of the last ice ages, including mammoths and mastodons. I'd like to, I often get asked, what's the difference between these two animals? Because they look so similar to each other, but there's actually some really important differences between them. Mammoths tend to stand higher than mastodons at the shoulder. Mammoths also have broader, more curved tusks in comparison to the straighter tusks that mastodon have and they also eat very different diets. Because these animals had very different diets, they actually have very different looking teeth, which allows them to eat those different diets. This is a mastodon tooth here on the left and a mammoth tooth on the right. And yes, these are individual teeth. You can immediately see the differences between these two different teeth. The mastodon has these cones that are great for chewing of leaves. And the mammoth tooth has all of these really hard plates that go across the surface of the tooth that allow it to eat grass. In particular, the Illinois State Museum has a really big collection of mastodons, one of the largest in North America, which is really convenient for me because it's one of the animals that I study. The shells that I'm showing you here are just full of mastodons. These are from a site called Boney Spring in Missouri. And what's special about this site is it's actually a place where they found over 31 individuals together. One of those individuals was a very large male, the largest known male mastodon in North America to date. As curator here at the museum, I have a lot of different jobs that involve studying the fossils, taking care of them, but also uh, helping other scientists study the fossils as well when they come visit. In this cabinet here, I have some very special fossils. These are specimens that have been extensively studied and have a lot of scientific value. 
So these are some more fossils from the Maison Creek. They're in this special cabinet because these are exquisite specimens. They have really well-defined features on them and good morphology and have been featured in publications. So these are what we call figured specimens, specimens that people have taken detailed photographs and drawings of and published in papers. Another thing that makes a specimen very important and valuable is if it's the first of its kind. That's called a type specimen. And it's what uh, we hold, it's the standard that we compare all others of its type to. It's the first one that's described and named. This specimen here in particular uh, has the distinction of not only being the first of its kind, but the only of its kind. So this makes it an incredibly valuable specimen for the museum. And so this is called a holotype. So because it's National Fossil Day, I hope you'll go out and look for fossils. But what happens if you do find a fossil? What should you do? Well, it depends what you find and where you find it. On private property, you can take fossils, but it's a good idea to contact an expert if you find something that you think is really important or rare. That lets scientists know that it exists and we might be able to then study it. You really shouldn't take things from parks, specifically national parks. Uh, there are restrictions and laws that prevent people from taking fossils, uh, and that's to protect the fossils themselves because they're a resource that can't be replaced. On federal land, you're allowed to take, in small amounts and quantities, things like invertebrates and plants, but you're not allowed to take vertebrates or things with bones. If you happen to find something that has a bone, again, call an expert, and we might be able to go check it out and see what it is. And finally, happy National Fossil Day. I hope in the future that we can look at fossils together, but stay safe for now.